What is that? What, what is that? This is Enchanted Rock, a huge billion-year-old pink granite dome that stands above the Texas Hill Country and is part of a larger feature called the Llano Uplift that records the history of multiple ancient supercontinents and sticks out like a sore thumb on the state geological map. So in this video, I'm going to take you through what I learned on a recent Geological Society of America field trip about the incredible journey that brought this billion-year-old granite up to the surface three times. So first things first, what is the Llano Uplift? The Llano Uplift is a low broad structural dome made of billion year old igneous and metamorphic rocks that have made their way up through younger Paleozoic and Mesozoic sediments and are now exposed at Earth's surface. The granites, gneisses, and schists of the Llano Uplift formed around 1.1 billion years ago due to the Grenville Orogeny or mountain building event during the formation of the supercontinent Rodinia. Today, this is one of the largest exposures of Grenville aged rocks in the southern U.S. And I actually think that the Texas Roadside Geology book does a better job explaining the geologic history of this uplift than I do. So I'm going to read a quick excerpt from this. And if you want to check it out, it's linked down below as well as all the other Roadside Geology books. Can't recommend more. So here's a few of my favorite parts of the Llano Uplift section of the Roadside Geology Texas book. Buried, squeezed, melted, faulted, then uplifted, the granite and schist formed the heart of once lofty mountain ranges that time has eroded flat, only to be later born again, raised to near surface, and finally exposed in central Texas by erosion. One billion years ago, the edge of North America collided with another landmass. This collision, known as the Llano event in Texas, was part of the larger Grenville mountain building event that served to consolidate the supercontinent Rodinia. Trapped in the subduction zone between colliding continents, pre Previously deposited sediments were squeezed, folded, and heated with such intensity that all the sedimentary minerals changed or metamorphosed into new crystalline forms. Rocks buried even deeper beneath the range melted and the ensuing magmatic mixture rose through the overlying rock column as large spherical bodies of red hot liquid. Eventually subduction ended, the magma solidified into granite, and the metamorphic rocks cooled to surface temperatures. The earth doesn't like topographic irregularities. So for the next few hundred million years, erosion wore the mountains down. By the time Ediacaran life was first abundantly preserved in the fossil record, so some of the earliest animals on Earth, around 600 million years ago, the old range was gone, worn to a tabletop. Along the same line where North America and its landmass neighbor were joined, the two continents rifted apart. Ocean water lapped over the flattened margin of North America once again, and for the next few hundred million years, beds of Paleozoic limestone, sandstone, and mudstone were deposited over the remnants of the once tall mountain range. About 335 million years ago, the eastern and southern margins of North America began to collide with other continents to form the supercontinent Pangaea. The mountain range formed by the collision rose across Texas along the same curved continental juncture that had formed nearly a billion years earlier, and geologists named this younger uplift the Wachita Mountains. And the Paleozoic rocks that had been deposited on the older Proterozoic surface were tilted and eroded, re-exposing the really old rocks of the Llano Uplift. So it continues on from there, and essentially the Llano Uplift kind of had this like bobber effect, and then it was formed and uplifted during Rodinia's formation a billion years ago, then covered by younger sediments, and then re-uplifted and exposed during Pangaea's formation around 250 to 300 million years ago, then covered by younger sediments yet again, and finally uplifted and exposed for a third time in the last 15 to 20 million years along the Balconis Fault Zone. This goes on to explain all of that and talks way more about the Balconis Fault Zone, which I have another video which I'll link down below if you want to hear more about that. But this still leaves the question, what about Enchanted Rock? How does Enchanted Rock, as I mentioned earlier, fit into all of this? Well, Enchanted Rock State Natural Area is within the Llano Uplift, but it is just granite and it only represents a portion of the entire uplift. Here's what roadside geology has to say. Despite their size, the domes are but a small piece of a huge round mass of granite that rose through the older schist like a giant hot balloon 
Moon about a billion years ago. The name Enchanted Rock comes from old Native American legends and pioneer observations of strange sounds and lights. Common creaking and groaning noises could easily be granite blocks grinding against one another as they expand and contract from heating and cooling between daytime and nighttime. Low light at dawn and sunset shimmers off crystals in the granite, and the sparkling reddish domes blend almost magically with the early morning and late evening sky. The rounded shape of the domes is caused by exfoliation, and not the kind you're thinking of. <laughs> granite forms deep within Earth's crust, and as thousands of feet of overlying rock are removed by erosion over geologic time, pressure caused by the weight of this pile of rock is reduced. The granite then expands a little in response to the lessened pressure, which in turn causes the granite to split in curved sheets. Weathering cracks the sheets, creating blocks and slabs which slide down slope. We saw so many of these cool exfoliation slabs kind of, well, they weren't sliding down the slope in real time, but eventually they will. And they were kind of just on the edge. And it just looks like a moment frozen in time when you look at rocks that exfoliate in this way, because you know they're moving and sometimes they have you know, more rapid events where something will fall down because something will break. But they do this in a very slow, protracted way over years and years and years of weathering. And it's just really cool to see this kind of frozen moment of this geologic process. But anyway, roadside geology goes on to talk about one feature that I was curious about that I didn't know how it worked until I read this, but they talk about the dikes that you can see as you're climbing this dome. Essentially, it says, the surface of enchanted rock is crossed by long linear bumps and rills representing dikes, which filled cooling cracks in the early granite batholith. As the granite magma cooled and crystallized, it shrank cracks developed, and a hot liquid from the last phase of the magmatic mush rushed in to fill the cracks. And this part's really cool. If the filling material is finer grained than the surrounding granite, it is slightly harder and resists erosion, so it stands up like a little ridge. But if the dike material is coarser grained, it weathers more easily, creating a linear depression in the surface rock. So these dikes are not different composition. They're still granitic magma that cooled. It's just a matter of, are they coarser grained? Did they cool slower? Or are they finer grained? Did they cool faster? And if they're finer grained, they might be more resistant to erosion and stand up like a ridge. And if they're coarser grained, they might create a depression that is like this linear depression feature that's just really weird. So that's how those weird features form. In my opinion, Enchanted Rock and the entire Alano uplift as a whole are very underrated as far as geologic features go. I mean, it just sticks out like a sore thumb on the state geologic map, and it invites so many questions. It's just so cool. But anyway, in the next couple of videos, we will explore the great unconformity of Texas and the beautiful, rare blue quartz or lanite that forms here in Lano, which we also got to see on our field trip. And if you want to go on a GSA field trip for yourself, they take place all over the country and sometimes even internationally every year. The next set of field trips will be associated with the 2026 GSA section meetings next March, April, and May. And you can sign up now. Links are down below. All right, and finally to the part of the video that I'm sure many of you are waiting for, the explanation of my shirt that I'm wearing and that I was wearing on this field trip. So just an abridged version of this backstory, when I was an undergrad at the University of Texas at Arlington, my very last year, the grad students in our department, our Earth and Environmental Science Department, decided to start an intramural soccer team just to have something that we can all do together that's fun and not just research. And uh, they invited some of us undergrads to come on the team as well because they needed more numbers. I mean, we were a small department and we were asking geologists to play soccer, which uh, not a lot of people did. <laughs> But I think we ended up having a couple professors join us. We had grad students, undergrads. It was really, really fun. And so anyway, our soccer team name, we were called the, the Fighting Trilobites, and we made these shirts. And the reason I wore it on this field trip was because the, one of the field trip leaders, Mike Reed, was my TA at UT Arlington when, you know, we decided to start the soccer team. And he made this, these shirts. He made these t-shirts. And when I saw that he was leading this field trip, I had to, of course, wear my trilobite shirt. So uh, my fighting trilobites. <laughs> and this hat is actually merch that I now make on 
my website. But um, but yeah, the this can be linked down below if you want. Uh, but I can't link this. This is one of a kind, one of a kind. Mike Reed fighting trilobites, UT Arlington shirt. So yeah, I don't think the soccer team is still happening. But um, it was fun while it lasted. <laughs>